Hello and welcome to No Rest for the Weekend. I'm Jason Godby, and today on the program, we're bringing you another news episode. Later, we'll be taking you to the Museum of Modern Art here in New York City for the premiere of the newly restored 1988 documentary, One Hand Don't Clap. But first, we've got an update on some upcoming movies. In January, we gave you a rundown of movies coming out here in 2023, but as it turns out, there's a lot more movies. All right, so these dates are subject to change. Please check your local listings, but let's get into it. First up, Cocaine Bear hits theaters on February 24th. That's right, there's a film called Cocaine Bear. In the film, a 500-pound black bear consumes a bunch of cocaine and goes on a drug-fueled rampage. This is a real movie. Someone wrote this as a script, pitched it, and it got made. It's directed by Elizabeth Banks, starring Kerry Russell, character actress Margot Martindale, and the late, great Ray Liotta. And this may be his final film appearance. So just marinate on that for a moment. So I saw the trailer for this movie, and if you want a film where a CGI bear eats a bunch of cocaine and goes on a murder spree, this is your movie. It looks ridiculous. I don't, I don't know what they're going for here. Maybe it'll be like a cult classic, or, or maybe it'll just be terrible. So it looks like one of those trailers that's like a parody of itself, like a parody trailer in a movie about how ridiculous movies are. But who knows? It'll probably win the Oscar for like best performance by a CGI bear. Next up in March, we have 65, opening on March 17th. This film is produced by Sam Raimi and comes to us from the writer of The Quiet Place. Stars Adam Driver as an astronaut who crash lands on a mysterious planet, only to discover he's not alone. As it turns out, and this is not a spoiler because it's in the trailer, he's actually crash landed on Earth 65 million years ago. So Adam Driver traveling back in time, getting chased by CGI dinosaurs. To me, this has a real like Planet of the Apes type vibe to it. I know that there was a Twilight Zone episode with a very similar premise years ago. So it has this old fashioned sci-fi type plot. Adam Driver, adventure, could be interesting. On March 24th, we have the new feature from director Zach Braff, A Good Person. Florence Pugh stars as Allison, a young woman who has everything going for her, a fiance, a career, family, friends, but her world gets turned upside down when she suffers a horrible tragedy, leaving her with an opioid addiction and unresolved grief. She befriends her would-be father-in-law, Morgan Freeman, and starts to put her life back together. Now, this is one of those movies coming out this year that isn't part of some huge mega franchise, and it's getting a theatrical release. Maybe people will come out for this one. I don't know. It'll probably do better on streaming, but it's just nice to see something different out there. Then in April, we've got Super Mario Brothers, the animated feature based on the popular Nintendo video game. Mario and Luigi navigate a labyrinth to save a princess. Now, back in 1993, there was a live-action Super Mario Brothers that starred Bob Hoskins and John Leguizamo. The movie was not well-received by fans or critics. It did so poorly that Nintendo wouldn't let anyone touch the property for years. So I think that going animated is definitely the right direction for this film. Really fits the material, and this could be the movie that Mario fans have been waiting for for 30 years. Super Mario Brothers is set to release on April 7th. On April 14th, we have Renfield, a new comedic take on the story of Renfield and his master Dracula, starring Nicholas Holt and Nicholas Cage. Holt plays Renfield, the tortured servant of Dracula, who after centuries of servitude and being forced to procure his master's prey, decides he wants to break away and have a life. In the film, Dracula has bestowed certain powers onto Renfield, so now we have a super-powered Renfield doing some superhero type stuff. And Nicolas Cage as Dracula, he's just chewing the hell out of the scenery. It looks completely bonkers. It's rated R, lots of blood and violence. Go figure, it's a vampire movie. It's great to see Nicolas Cage in real movies again after a long stint uh, in rather obscure direct-to-VOD type stuff. I also think it's great to see him let off the chain. This is gonna be pure Cage. It should be a lot of fun. On May 19th, the 10th Fast and Furious film will crash into theaters. They're calling this one Fast X. It stars Vin Diesel, Charlize Theron, Helen Mirren, Jason Momoa, Brie Larson, and Rita Moreno. Just saying that sounds surreal. The first Fast and Furious movie came out more than 20 years ago. 
it's pretty incredible that this saga is still ongoing. Fast cars, explosions, people punching people, outlandish stunts that involve cars flying off of things, and of course, it's all about family. Expected to arrive in theaters on May 26, The Machine. Bert faces a family crisis with the arrival of his estranged father, played by Mark Hamill. The dad's past has caught up with them when they are kidnapped by Russian gangsters seeking revenge against Hamill for crimes he committed 20 years ago while on a drunken bender in Russia. It, it sounds intriguing. Love seeing Mark Hamill back on the big screen again. Finally arriving in theaters June 16th, The Flash. There's been a lot of conjecture surrounding this film, which could be a whole show in and of itself, but let me just talk about the plot of the movie first. So in this movie, Barry Allen slash The Flash runs so fast he creates a glitch in time and he crosses into other dimensions and has to seek help from the Batman. Now, this is actually based loosely on a comic book called Flashpoint, which came out back in, I think, 2011. The Flash TV show also used this, and there's a really good animated film called Flashpoint Paradox that you should check out if you're a Flash fan. The film stars Ezra Miller. Miller has been in the news a lot lately, which is where a lot of the conjecture has come from. Like I said, not gonna go into it. That's a whole different show. The Flash has been in development forever, roughly ever since Ezra Miller was cast for the role in the DC Universe. A number of writers and directors have been attached and then unattached, left the project, joined the project. Finally, Andy Muschietti, uh, who directed the IT films, was brought on to helm the film and bring it in for a landing. The movie was finished, but since the controversy with Miller's hit, the project kind of went into limbo. So DC slash Warner Brothers slash Discovery has finally decided to release it and we'll see how fans react. This is a movie fans of the franchise have wanted to see for a long time. Ben Affleck is back as Bruce Wayne slash Batman. And we're also getting Michael Keaton back as an alternate universe Batman. How great is that? Are you glad this is finally coming out? Uh, what are your feelings on this? Let me know. Coming to Netflix June 16th, Chris Hemsworth will reprise his role as Tyler Rake in Extraction 2. Sam Hargrove will return as director. Now, the first Extraction was just a slam-bang action thrill ride. Lots of fun. We reviewed it on the show back in 2020. I said then that I thought Netflix was looking for an action franchise, and here we are. If you're an action fan, definitely check out Extraction, and that'll prepare you for Extraction 2. Also on June 16th, the new animated feature from Disney, Elemental. Here's the premise. In a city where fire, water, land, and air residents live together, a fiery young woman uh, and a go-with-the-flow guy discover something elemental, how much they actually have in common. I haven't seen much on this one, but can Disney do it again with another animated feature? We'll see. In August, we have Disney's The Haunted Mansion, based on the popular theme park attraction, in this film, a single mom named Gabby hires a tour guide, a psychic, a priest, and a historian to help exorcise her newly purchased mansion after discovering it is inhabited by ghosts. It's a star-studded cast, Rosario Dawson, Jamie Lee Curtis, Winona Ryder, Owen Wilson, Jared Leto, Lakeith Stansfield, Tiffany Haddish, and Danny DeVito, among others. Set for release August 11th. Moving into the fall, on October 6th, Sony brings us another Spider-Man villain with Kraven the Hunter. In the movie, Russian immigrant Sergei Kravenov is on a mission to prove that he's the greatest hunter in the world, starring Aaron Taylor Johnson and Russell Crowe. Now, Sony has had mixed success with these films so far. Venom was a big hit, the sequel also did well, and then Morbius didn't do so well, and now we got Kraven the Hunter. Are you excited for this? Did you like the previous films? Let me know. And for this next one, we don't have a release date, but Napoleon is slated for release in 2023 on Apple TV. It stars Joaquin Phoenix in the titular role, directed by Ridley Scott. Napoleon is the historical drama about the French leader's rise to power. I thought this was interesting just because it's Ridley Scott, who's made some incredible films. His filmography is legendary and he's still making epics at the age of 86. Amazing. So those are some more films coming out in 2023. As I mentioned, these dates are all subject to change, so please check your local listings. It looks like an exciting year. Everything from the ridiculous to the sublime.
Moving on now to our featured story, the newly restored 1988 documentary One Hand Don't Clap, screened as part of the To Save and Project Film Festival in January at the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. I had a chance to speak with the film's director, Kaveri Call. It's very exciting to be here. It's also very unbelievable. This is a film that I made, I completed in 1988. The film had a full life at that moment. And then I thought that it's had its life. So it's thrilling that it's going to have another life. Uh, preservation is very exciting. Uh, the restoration of films is so critical to preserving the film format and to preserving the stories we tell. The film is about calypso music and the emergence of soca. It's the story is told by two legends of that world, Lord Kitchener and Calypso Rose. The story begins in Brooklyn with the recording studios that were started by the West Indian American community and it travels with the music down to Trinidad, where every year the West Indian community gathers for carnival and the Calypso Monarch competition and Calypso's, the whole country celebrates the festivities for a period of months. That's how the film began. I was born in India. I grew up with, the, with sitar music and tabla music in my home and over a period of time, I discovered that people outside my home didn't know this music. So as I grew older, I started wondering what other music is there out there that they haven't told me about. So when a West Indian friend suggested taking me to Brooklyn to hear Calypso music, I was ready. When the film premiered at Telluride, it was uh, a moment of not knowing how the audience would respond. It was fabulous to be invited to Telluride, but that's a location way up in the mountains of Colorado. I have never heard steel drum there or heard anyone singing Calypso there. And the audience responded so enthusiastically. I was very delighted. Uh, mostly they said, why haven't we heard this before? And uh, I could only say, that's right. Why haven't you heard this before? But I'm glad you did hear it now. This audience, I think, will be different. Times have changed. People are a little more familiar with different kinds of music. There's a large West Indian community in New York City and they are very enthusiastic about the film because it's their culture. It's the legends of Calypso music that live on through this film. Preservation is a very unique process and a, a unique phase in the life of a film. So when the Academy Film Archive and the Women's Film Preservation Fund got together and said, let's preserve your film. My first response was really, well, what do you mean? And then as they explained how the preservation would fight off the deterioration that happens with any film, I got more and more excited and I was really delighted that there were institutions and groups that wanted to preserve this particular film. A lot of the people in the film are gone. Lord Kitchener the Grand Master of Calypso died in 2000. Many of the people in the film are gone. Stalin died recently, last year. So it's a very, very important that this cultural documentation of the contribution of West Indians to the world of music should live on for everyone to see, everyone in the world. Plans for the re-release of One Hand Don't Clap are in the works right now. We just completed 
the restoration process and what a magnificent way to launch it at to save and project. So from here on, we will be exploring other venues for screening the film at festivals, in theaters, for distribution of various kinds. And uh, we're just at stage one of that. We've just completed that very, very important step of restoration. And now we move on to the next important step. I think that most people don't realize that they've heard clips of music and the music of uh, Lionel Richie, of Harry Belafonte. Uh, it's inspired Mick Jagger. So it has been borrowed, which is fine, but listen to the real Calypso. Another feature documentary that I made recently, it's called The Bengali. In it, I take an African-American woman back to India with me. India is where I was born, in search of her family's past. Her grandfather was one of the first Indians to come to America in the late 19th century. It's lost history, and her journey becomes a search for where he came from and what it might mean to her. I just came back from India, where it was shown in many cities. I took it back to the village where we filmed. So we're exploring further distribution of that film as it continues to make its way all over the world. For more information on Kaveri Call, her website is kavericall.com. I also had a chance to speak with NYWIFT executive Susan Lazarus about the Women's Film Preservation Fund. It started in 1995 when Barbara Moss, who was on the board of New York Women in Film, came to Mary Lee Bandy at MoMA and they discussed what could be done to preserve films by women. And MoMA agreed to, to become a partner and the, the fund was born. We raise money and we give grants to filmmakers or archives to preserve films in which women had a unique uh, creative role. Because women have been making films since the dawn of cinema, since the 1890s. Really, Barbara was in film school and, and uh, wanted to ask where were the films by women and the, the teacher said there weren't any. So people did not know. So the idea was find the films, preserve the films, teach the films, and show that women were, have always been there. And sure enough, we've discovered many films. Um, we've preserved over 160 right now. A few years ago, we had a call for proposals, and Kaveri Call presented One Hand Don't Clap. We were excited to be able to support the film, and the Academy Film Archive has been a partner in preserving the film with us, and her materials will be stored at the Academy. One Hand Don't Clap was shot on film, and the, 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 the possibilities for films shot on film are they can, be, they can have shrinkage, they can have vinegar syndrome, which is decay, basically, it turns to acid. And if it's not stored properly at 50% humidity, dry enough or not too, not too dry conditions, the film can decay. Her film elements were in pretty good shape, but it was impossible to see the film. You couldn't project a 16 millimeter print anymore. It's very, it's very rare. So we gave her the money to do a digital preservation, in which case you can clean up the, the material once you've digitized it. She updated her subtitles to make them more accurate, and we were created a digital exhibition master so that uh, it can be seen. Every year, the Museum of Modern Art has a series called To Save and Project, where they premiere films that have been preserved from all eras of film history. And this one's pretty modern, 1988, and for us, it's also a pretty modern film. But, you know, 35 years ago, uh, time, is, time is flying, and it's an important historical document, as well as a, a, a fun film to watch. So we are very proud to be able to be in the festival. It's an honor uh, to be part of this festival. And then we look forward to, to being able to 
you know, have the film seen in, in other places um, and to continue to be recognized. I think we've done films from almost every decade of the 20th century. Silent films, early sound films, The Blot by Lois Weber, which was a very important film. Um, we've done several Alice Guy Blechet films. We, we preserved uh, Growing Up Female and Union Maids by Julia Reichert and Jim Klein. We're very excited that these films are getting accepted in the National Film Registry, as well as the Wobblies, a film that we preserved. We preserved Harlan County, USA. It's very hard to bring awareness to films that need preservation. It's an expensive medium, film preservation. And now with the digital, digital exhibition and digital files that need to be made, it doubles the cost. So we are always on the look, look out for sponsors and for individuals who would like to donate to make sure that films by women are known about and, and become part of the lexicon and the canon of filmmaking to make sure that these film by, films by women are in an archive that can take care of them for hundreds of years and make sure that the films are seen. For more on the Women's Film Preservation Fund and NYWIFT, visit womensfilmpreservationfund.org or nywift.org. And that's all the time we have for today. Thanks so much for taking this trip down the rabbit hole. For more of our content, including our movie reviews, visit our website, norestfortheweekendpodcast.com. You can subscribe on your favorite podcast app or on YouTube, youtube.com slash getbehindtherabbit. I'd like to thank Kaveri Call and Susan Lazarus for coming out to speak with me. And, of course, a big thanks to our sponsor, JMR Rentals. For Behind the Rabbit Productions, I'm Jason Godby. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time.